Welcome to the t- 2020 Racing for Recovery podcast. I'm Todd Crandall, and I have one Mr. Bobby Alvarez with me today. How are you, brother? Doing good. Doing I good. see you have, I've been thinking since I asked you to be on this, I'm like, okay, how am I going to start this with you? So I asked you to wear that jersey. Um, let me ask you this to start this. What is the coolest time you wore that jersey? On stage with Aerosmith. Right. And where were we? In Vegas. So let's start with that. You were, what, three months sober then? A month and a half. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, three months. Three months. What was that experience like going out to Vegas to see Errol Smith, being three and a half months sober? Amazing. Just like the connection that was made with the four people that were on that trip was like nothing I ever, you know, felt or imagined, you know, and – I'm three months sober and I'm like, wow, I'm going to Vegas. Like I'm on an airplane with Todd Crandall going to Vegas to see Aerosmith on stage. Like that's something I never thought would ever happen. You know, that's so let's, okay. Now I want to back up a bit. What, tell me, what was your life like prior to coming to racing for recovery? How did it not go the way you had hoped life would have? Where do you want me to start? Wherever you want. I mean, my 20s was a uh, a mess, you know? I mean, I, I I never could get it together, like, you know? I mean, even when I when me and Nicole had Eliana and I, I was doing everything I was supposed to as a dad, you know, there were, I'd still go out on the weekend and drink and be, I mean, I would drink until I, I passed out, you know? and, and so I could never get it together, even even as a, a new dad. Like I still had like that feeling inside me, like I was worthless, and it just it always ate away at me. You know, I had regrets from when I was in high school that would eat away at me when I was 23 or 24, and then now, you know, a couple of years ago, those regrets would eat away at me when I was 23, 24, 25, and and then my the worthlessness oh it just built and built and built till i didn't want to live where do you think that worthlessness feeling came from how did all this start um i think it's gonna sound crazy but i think when i uh when we moved out here from new jersey and um when i like just gave up on myself with football i mean i love football football was my life and i got really homesick one one week and uh I, I didn't go to school and excuse me and and uh, I lost like my that that week I didn't start because I missed school so Friday night I didn't start and then Monday came and I just I didn't even practice I didn't care I just stood on the sidelines I didn't want to get back in because it just it it wasn't what I wanted you know and um, I I I'm looking around and I'm like I don't know any of these people I'm out here playing and you know and. It just I gave up on myself and that's that's the first time I gave up on myself was at 17 18 and then it just snowballed into everything were you cognizant of what you were doing at that time that you just described like when you're just not playing and everything were you aware of like really what you were thinking no I mean I just didn't care like I I, I got to a point in life where at such a young age I didn't care at all about anything. I was angry. I hated life. I, I hated my parents. And, you know, I just just had like this anger inside of me. And I think it was all just from hurt, you know. And Well, yeah. football was a pretty big thing for you. And to give that up, the way you're describing it, that's pretty significant. Yeah, yeah, it was huge, you know. Do you, were you drinking at this time? No, I, I hadn't, I mean, I had drank before you know like in you know living in New Jersey like I had drank with my friends you know on occasion but I was I I would go to parties and I wouldn't even drink you know I I think I'd smoked weed once didn't like it um I I remember I do remember though like being young with my cousin and we would drink like my mom's box of wine Mm -hmm. you know like after parties it'd be boxes of wine or like wine coolers or beer even beer left over like barbecues and stuff. And I remember drinking then and loving it, you know, like thinking like, oh, this is so cool. But then when I got into my teens, like, well, I guess, yeah, I was like 12, 13 then. 
And then when, when I got really into football in high school, I, I, I didn't really – I didn't even see a point to drink, you know. Even though I saw, like, people around me drinking and, like, it looked fun, you know, like at barbecues. Like, I rarely saw my dad drink. Never saw my mom drink. And, um, you know, it was just at, like, like holidays or, or barbecues in the summer where I'd see my dad having a couple of beers. But it, other than that, never, you know. So a lot of – and you've learned this at Racing for Recovery. We talk about, well, there's reasons why we started drinking or using cocaine or whatever mm-hmm. it was, right? So you've described – Okay, I move out here. You said, I didn't like my parents. I just, I quit football and you weren't really drinking. Is this where, because of how you were feeling, drinking started to escalate? 100%. So describe to people what this next process of your life was like. So the next process was I went out with my cousins one night and I think I was 19 and they knew the bouncer at this club or bar or whatever it is chasers and I got in and I I drank and got drunk and you know I, I I don't know if it was that night or another night there was a huge fight but I was like this is amazing like just so just that first you know those first couple experiences at the bar like drinking and it's like I found what I want you know and then after that it was like a year later I started doing cocaine and what go cocaine, ahead no I was going to say Were you aware at any time during this that even alcohol was a problem or was it not? Not, not yet. I I didn't see it as a problem, I think, until I moved back to New Jersey and I was drinking every day and I I was coaching Pop Warner football and I I showed up to practice drunk a few times after work. I'd stop at the bar and have a few beers, you know, I mean, I'd slam them on my way and then go to practice and I'd be drunk. And I remember a couple of parents, like it was brought to my attention, like, are you drinking? And I'm like, no, I had a couple of beers with guys in the parking lot at work, you know, and when we got off, no, 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 you know, but then that's when I really saw drinking as a problem. So the first time you did cocaine, um, did you know it was a problem or were you like, this is awesome, it feels good? What was that I, like? I thought it was awesome. I was hanging out with two girls and they were driving one one girl was driving the other was in the front seat and i'm just sitting in the back and the cd case was getting passed around while we're driving around toledo and i'm like this is amazing and then so that was the first time and i i don't know how much i did it doesn't matter but you know and then i didn't touch cocaine for a year so it was like i started drinking and then I, a year later i did cocaine but then i didn't touch it again for like a year and and through these those two years I mean, it was always pointed out to me, like, you got a problem. Like, you, you're at the bar all the time, my mom, you know. And so she would call me excessively, and it it would, it would made me like, well, I, I'm staying out now because if if you think it's wrong, I'm going to keep doing it because mm-hmm. I want to piss you off. Mm-hmm. Excuse my language. Right. And, um, you know, so then it just, it all, be, you know, it was all bad. It's a mess. You know? Yeah, it was a mess. So – Let's do this. Can you condense your cocaine usage and when you finally decided, I have to do something about this, mm-hmm. let people know what that process was like? Yeah. So I was, um, I was working at Jeep and um, I was buying cocaine at Jeep on the line at work, do- doing it in the bathroom and, or outside and it is was, that why my jeep is all messed up absolutely okay good i just wanted to figure that out all right does it rattle <laughs> yes <laughs> that was the alvarez model yeah right absolutely um <laughs> so yeah i was working at jeep and and doing doing that and then um so the night where i really realized like i had like a like an awakening like i have a problem was me and nicole were working on getting back together and we went to the bar and we were had a couple beer. We were going to have a couple drinks before we went and talked or went to her parents for dinner or something. But that night she got really drunk, threw up and everything. I took her home, but we left her, she left her card at the bar and I used her card to buy cocaine for myself. Mm. And $400 later I was, you know, and I'm in a horrible calm down and I'm laying in bed with her and I'm like, I'm caught. Like I, you know, and then I started thinking, like, this isn't normal. It, it, 
people don't do this. And then a week later, I was out in Glen Bay in Rock Creek, Ohio for 30 days. What was that like? Were you ready? Were you no, ready to go to treatment? absolutely not. Because as soon as I got out, I was drinking again. And then, so everything condensed. Two years after that is when I first came to Racing for Recovery. And the first time I walked in this building, I was on my way here and I was thinking that I wanted to get high and I was going to have my dealer come pick me up at Racing for Recovery. And I was going to leave. My dad was dropping me off. I was going to leave. I walked in the building and I had a sense of like serenity. Like I felt peace. And I went to the, it was a Wednesday night meeting and Bruce was doing it. And I just, I, it was just like peaceful. And I was like, wow, man, everything went away. Like that anxiety and like, like that, that feeling like I, like of wanting to puke because I, I want to go get high. I want to go drink. I want to get Coke. I want to get high. I want to, you know, I want to, that, I want to destroy my life again. It, it, it went away. I walked in this building, it went away. The green walls, everything. It just, something about it. And it, unfortunately, it took me two years from that point to really figure it out that, that I wanted to change. And um, yeah, that's when I decided to go into lodging. I've never, I've never heard you describe it like that before. Yeah. So I do, I do want to ask you about this stuff. So w your first attempt coming in here, you love it, the vibe, and I hear that all the time. Man, it's so positive in here in the green walls, and this is great. It's nothing like I've ever seen, mm -hmm. and that's a common thing. What were we offering you that resonated with you? And then to use some humor on there, why'd you screw it up? <laughs> and then we'll talk about when you come back and it's stuck. Yeah. But I want to know the first time, like, what, what, what did you like, and then what went wrong? What I liked was... Um how everyone just was like greeted me you know like like um bruce saw it like he walked in he saw me and he was like hey you're new never seen you before you know and it was like wow you know like i got acknowledged you know it's like i didn't go and sit down and be quiet and not talk you know um you know i, I was able to explain right off the bat like who you know why i am here what's your name why are you here you know, and I was like, wow, that's pretty cool, you know, and I didn't have to say I was an addict, even though I did, I did say it, and then I came on, I didn't, I didn't come the next night, I didn't come to the Thursday meeting, but I came Monday to the book study, mm -hmm. and I brought the book, the big book with me, I didn't know. That's you know? great. Yeah, so I brought the big book, and I'm like, okay, nobody else has it, what's going on here, and then somebody handed me a book you know, to, to borrow. And I put the big book on the chair and pushed it under the table. Like, I That's was like, funny. Oh wow. I didn't know this was different. They gave you, you know? the Cleveland book. Yeah. The Cleveland book. That's awesome. Yeah. God, so, I haven't heard some of this stuff about you before. Yeah, this is yeah. great. So were you doing IOP then too? No, not yet. I, I was still in uh, arrowhead. I was still doing uh, the PHP at arrowhead when I was coming to the, when I started coming to the meetings here. So Randall is who, so like six months before that, me and Randall were in PHP together, and he is the one who told me about racing for recovery. So I had a you know a little inkling about what went on here. You know, he was like, dude, they have a pool table. You know, they have the Xbox, and you could ha just hang out. You you just go there and sit around and hang out and talk. He's like, they have uh, the TV. You could watch TV whenever you want. So I was like, wow, that's different. It's like a, a just like a sober hangout. Like it's cool. You just like like a, a place where people could just go. And then, you don't, you know, for free, like go and sit and just hang out if I needed to go somewhere. And I never took advantage of that for those six months. And then I, another, like a girl I was in PHP with was in lodging with Arrowhead over here. And she was coming to the meetings. I'm not going to say her name, but I don't, but, um, so we started, I, I met her here one night and, um, it was that's it was that Wednesday night and I um she actually didn't come and then she wasn't here that Wednesday or the Monday but then the Thursday night she was like yeah we're going and I was like okay and uh that was the first time I saw you and I remember like looking at your like your picture and I'm like I thought he played like a professional sport I'm like he doesn't I'm like okay whatever you know <laughs> that's great <laughs> yeah and uh so 
Yeah, and that's the first time I met you, and the tables were still in, like, the square. Yeah. And uh, I sat, like, n- almost next to Kelly. So she was over here, and I sat at the other end of that table up front. And um, you said something to me. I can't remember. but uh, Or I, I said why I'm here, and you pointed out what I said. And um, so all those all those little things built up to be a big thing on why I just kept coming back and coming back and coming back over the course of two years trying to figure out what I wanted. It seems like you felt accepted here. Absolutely. You felt it was normal. It was mm-hmm. inviting. It was fun. It was uh, energetic. Yeah. And it's kind of ironic yeah. you brought up Randall, and Randall was on the trip to Vegas, Vegas. for Aerosmith yeah. too, right? yeah. So you unfortunately make a decision to stop coming and go back to, you know, drinking and drugging and whatever. Are you cognizant of like why you went back to using? Yeah, because I didn't work on anything that was bothering Mm. me. Like nothing that was deep inside me that that made me screw up my life in the first place. Mm. I never talked about it. I just was like, I have a drug problem. I have a drinking problem. I just got to stop. Yeah. But, like, I never talked about the deep stuff, you know. And the first time I ever talked about how quitting on myself in football, like, snowballed into 12, 13 years of bullshit. Mm-hmm. Excuse my language again. I I felt, like, dumb. Like, wow, that that one thing. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, even though, it, you know, but I and I made my, you know, like, I kind of got over it then. You know, like, I... I kind of got past the hurt of it, you know, and then I started working on other things like so that like that was like the first thing that that started a million things that were way worse that I did or said or how I hurt my family, my sister, you know, disappeared on Eliana for a while, you know, so and I was able to talk about everything, you know. So let's flip this around to the good stuff. You come you come back. Mm hmm. You came back with a totally different mindset mm-hmm. this time. So what did you do? I mean, let me say this. I know one of the things you did, you were coming to the IOP groups and we started doing one-on-ones. Yes. So what? how were those then really helping you to get to, and by the way, let's not overlook this, you have a year of sobriety today. Today. Which is awesome. And yeah. I'm proud as hell of you for having that. Thanks, man. But I, I want to know, like coming back, the different decisions you were making on getting help how that helped you to get the year that you have today okay so basically a year ago today so 365 days ago (laughs) it was a thursday and me and my mom came in and sat right here yeah and i told you well it happened again and you were like what and i said i used again last night and i and i had a couple months at that time and because i was doing the one well i don't maybe I don't know what I had. You were in and out. In and out. That's all. For two years, I was in and out. Now, and I told, and you were like, what? Why? Like, come on. And seeing that, so seeing like the hurt in my parents' eyes and then the hurt in your eyes, and it's like, damn, I got to do something. And I hadn't made the decision, you know, the night before, like, I'm, I need to quit Lowe's. Not that it had anything to do with Lowe's. I need to quit working. I need to quit, you know, trying to just make money because it's not helping me. Mm or Eliana, and then I thought about it. I wasn't sure how it worked, but to come into lodging. And I made that, that, that move for 10 months. I moved into lodging, and, you know, I got lucky with, with two good roommates right off the bat. You know, somebody, Dave, who I, who um, was just, you know, he changed me, I changed him, he was grumpy. and He's a grumpy you know, old man. Yeah, you know, and... You know, and he just, you know, he would play Metallica, blast Metallica at six in the morning, and I'd wake up to it, and he'd be like, I don't understand how you wake up so happy. This shit pisses me off, and, you know. And, but he would laugh about mm-hmm. it, and it became a good friend to me, you know. And then my next roommate was great, you know, somebody I knew for years, and, you know, I mean, he helped me throughout my entire the, the, the year. You know, he was there, and I talked with him, and, we had a great relationship and, you know, moved into the condo and, you know, that's when I was like, I felt like I was out on my own then, you know, like I, yeah, I had roommates, but I wasn't living in a room with another person. 
and um, I, you know, doing my own laundry, dishes, and maintaining, and and you know, I had to cut the grass because I messed that one up. So the maintenance guy was cutting in. I said, oh, I'll cut our grass. Don't worry about it. We didn't have a lawnmower or nothing. So I had to borrow my dad's. And, right. <laughs> you know, but so it's all right, you know. And and then I started missing Eliana bad. And that's, I was like, I, I'm ready to go home. Mm -hmm. I'm ready to be with my daughter, my family, you know. And I felt mentally, like I, I, I built myself up mentally well enough to deal with any negativity that would come my way. You know, so let's do this. I tell me how how did counseling and the IOP groups how did they help you? Because I want to, and I'm asking you this, Bobby, because I want people that are watching this to to understand that what we're doing is not traditional. Yeah. Where we hand you a worksheet that mm -hmm. says, "Tell me your drug of choice for the 500th time." Draw a happy face or a frown how you're feeling today. We don't mm -mm. do that. So mm -hmm. I tell tell people that are watching this, like, what counseling and IOP did for you? So um, IOP, I mean, being in another room with, you know, 15, 20 people, you know, two two or three different counselors or, you know, whatever it was in there, two, two different. And um, it just, you know, like, when you talked, attention was on you. And um, you were allowed to talk like yeah. that. That's what it was like, you know, like I'm in there and I'm, I'm talking about things. Other people are talking about things and it's not like pushed aside or even if it's like something that was meant for a one on one, that person was allowed to finish. And then it was like, OK, we could get deeper in, into this in a one on one. Mm -hmm. So if you want to set that up. So it was still recognized and then recognized again in a one on one if that person chose to do a one on one. And um just the IOPs was like, I mean, you, I, I was in mostly IOPs with you mm -hmm. and it, I, I related to you because we're both, we were both addicts and both in recovery mm -hmm. and, you know, 20 something years ago, you were feeling how I was feeling. So it was all, it was all relative, you know, and you you didn't compare like well you know my mom killed herself and you quit football that that's you know what the hell you know get over it no that didn't happen it was you know the the pain behind everything is what caused us to do drugs and it all it was all relative we, that's how racing for recovery is different we all we relate to each other you know because our hurt whether it's big or small it's the same because it caused us to to try to destroy our life that's awesome so let's do this. Let's talk about some good stuff. 2019 was a pretty awesome year for Amazing. you. Amazing. So let let's start with what was the the first thing you did was we went to Aero, we went to Aerosmith, yeah, right? Yeah, Aerosmith. Yep. By the way, what's your favorite song by those guys? Um, Sweet Emotion. That or, was awesome. You know, um, Kings and Queens. Right. That's when they Stephen took my phone yeah. during Kings and Queens, yes. right? That was funny. Yeah. Um, I do. I want to bring this up again with you wearing that jersey and it's in our new book choices and consequences yeah I, I remember you know errol smith's playing we're in vegas and i'm standing you had your your back to me you were up closer than i was and i was just standing there looking at you watching everything in front of you and i'm like this is this is what i wanted to do with this program it's like all these other things are going on we're at errol smith we're on stage with them but my whole focus was literally just looking at you and knowing how much you were into that scene right there. And I'm I'm appreciative of you just getting your act together so I could be a part mm. of, of that event. It was truly remarkable. And if, if anybody has our Choices and Consequences book, there's a picture of Bobby in there that's just, I can't I can't see your face, Yeah. but I know what the smile oh, must yeah. have been like, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That was incredible. Yeah. Um, so what else did you do in 2019 with us? So after that, um, I, I made a pretty um serious threat that there a certain amount of days you know and uh i better be doing something else <laughs> that's funny <laughs> and uh that that sign's actually hanging in the building you know with mine and randall's notes on the back but um i want to explain what you're talking about because people right now probably don't understand this okay, so sure 
What Bobby's referring to in a very serious but yet comical manner is we, we do a lot of things for a lot of people. Yes. And we took a group of folks to see Metallica in Cleveland, and one of the guys had never done anything like that and was upset that within 30 days we didn't do yeah. something like that again. And I thought, man, you know, one of the things we talk about in here so much is gratitude. Mm. And it, it, it rocked me in a way that I was like, well, dude, we, we just did this 30 days ago. And his response was, well, yeah, it was 30 days ago. What are you, what are we, what are you doing for me next? Yeah. And when you jokingly yeah. said that to me on the plane coming home from Vegas, you got 30 <laughs> days or else. That's one of the funniest things I've ever heard, you know, but you were, you appreciated what we, yeah. what Racing for Recovery was doing for you. So yeah. carry on with the other things you were doing. So it was like, you know, I think it was like 32 days later, right? unfortunately, but um, that was Wisconsin. Yeah. We went to Wisconsin and that was, I mean, I've never been to Wisconsin, but it was also my first time seeing an Ironman race and you know, it was just amazing. Like, you know, the whole prep for it, you know, the night before and then the morning and like the joking and the playing the music and like we're hanging out, but, and then driving there, you know, I mean, it was just awesome. And watching you, you know, get in the water and swim and then come out and, you know, smiling and then getting on the bike, smiling and then, it was just an awesome experience seeing like, you know, like the grueling, you know, um, just just how hard it is to com compete and and complete an Ironman race. But, you know, like you're you were happy throughout the entire thing. Like every time you saw us, mm -hmm. who, you, you know, like your cheer squad, you know, like how it was just like, you know, and I'm sure it gave you like a, a nice jolt of energy, mm -hmm. you know, and um so I always wondered what the Iron Man, ever since I started hearing you talk about it, like what it was like. And it's just amazing, you know, like the whole thing, you know. Can you, how do you relate to that? You talked about how hard it is. Yeah, yeah. How do you relate to that to your own recovery? Yeah. So like I, I've said it before, like it's like, um, you know, like especially like a, a full, like the 140 miles, mm. it, it, you don't, you can't give up on yourself. If you want to, if you want to finish it, you know, you got to keep pushing. You got to fight through the hurt, the pain, you know, you know, all that agony. And that's what you got to do in recovery. You know, like, I, yeah, that agony is going to lessen throughout my life. I mean, I hope, you know, and um, so as I hit two years or three years, you know, and I go into the future, you know, that it's going to get less and less. But like, I, I can only imagine that you know, competing in an Ironman, like what you feel like, like I could give up today if I want it, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? But where's that going to put me? Nowhere. Right. It's going to set me so far back. So, and if you gave up on yourself in a race, you didn't finish. That's, That's right. all it is. You know, you know what's so. interesting. You're, we're talking about going to Ironman, Wisconsin. You're talking about the Ironman, which is, yeah, that was cool. But do you have any idea what I'm thinking about with you going to Wisconsin right now? No. The what? television interview you did. The yeah, 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 and I did that you, out there. Right, yeah. and describing what it's like to be a sober father. Yeah. And your relationship yeah, with, you know, your daughter mm -hmm. and everything. And it's like, it's interesting hearing you describe Wisconsin. But for me, it's all about the other stuff that doesn't even right. involve the Iron Man, right? right? So what was it like being on their local NBC or whatever, talking about your recovery? I was so nervous at first. I, I like, it was the first time I ever got interviewed, really, for anything. And um, I had my Sober Not Boring shirt on. And um, it just, I was, I was afraid I was going to say the wrong thing. But then when I got into it, I just, it was awesome. You know, yeah. like, and, um, like, put on the spot like that, ask questions, like, it was the, like such a true like answer, you know what I mean? Pure, like it, what came out of me was right there on the spot, like Eliana, yes. you know, like what, why did you get sober Eliana? You know, like, well, what are your plans for the future Eliana? You know, and, and yeah, I got sober for myself because, but like if I didn't get sober for myself, then I, I wouldn't have my daughter, Right. <laughs> you know? So, yeah. I mean, that little girl is my world. 
That's you know, awesome. she's everything to me. So, so let's see. We I want to cover this too. You we you went to Ironman, Ohio. Mm -hmm. and went to Ironman Traverse City. Yeah. So we've talked about watching those races, but more importantly, what was the camaraderie that you started to build with some of the guys and girls that went on that trip? What, yeah. was, what was that like? And what is it like, the friendships you've made? Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, just those, those friendships mean everything, you know? I mean, just like um, in IOP the, or OP the other day, whatever it was, um, Mikey was like, yeah, I was watching you in Traverse City, and like, he he said he was kind of jealous of me because I was just all over the place talking with people and friendly, and he said that, you know, like, he kind of wants to be like that, and um, it kind of like hit me like, damn, like somebody wants to be like me, um, wow, and you know, like, like so that like, when we were there, and I I, I like to hang back and be with you know, like you and be by the tent in the, you know, like in Traverse City, we had the thing in the expo. Like I wanted to be there because that was like the great part of the experience for me was like representing racing for recovery, you yeah. know? And um, he hung back instead of going to the dunes, he hung back with us. And he like, I kind of looked at him like, man, that's awesome. The first, you know, like he, he could have just easily been like, you know, I'm, nothing against the people that went to the dunes. That's right. awesome because yeah. we couldn't all hang out in the tent anyway. Yeah. But, like, like he hung back because he was interested with what everything that goes on with these Ironman mm -hmm. events. And um, I looked at him with such, like, admiration and respect, you know. And then to hear him months later say that he was looking at me like, man, that dude's so cool. He taught, you know, he's – it's now that's a friendship right there that I don't ever want to lose. Right. You know, like that guy, I want to be friends with him forever. Is stuff like that, is it helping to build your self-esteem and your self-worth? Oh, you yeah. You start to see it, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, I still struggle with, like, my self-worth, but um, I just have the power now, like, that strength to, like, knock it down. Like, yesterday, I kind of had a rough day and, would, you know, feeling worthless. And um, came to the meeting and it went away, you know. I yeah. mean, there, there's things that I do that knock that stuff down, you know? I mean, it's just, I'm, I'm sure I'll struggle with it for a while, if not the rest of my life, but I, I just have the power to to get through it. Like that, I have more positivity than negativity in my life that, that can help me, so. What was it like having your mom last night at the support group meeting acknowledge <laughs> your year of sobriety? It was awesome, you yeah. know, you know. It's my mom, you know, and, and she's proud that her son has a year, yeah. you know, and that, that's awesome. And, uh, you know, my mom is, has always been over the top. So like her, so I'm, I'm going to own this room right now. It was awesome. You know I mean? I, and then her talking about her parents, you know, that, that hit me because, you know, m my grandma's like dying wish towards me was, mm -hmm. I want you to stay. Um, what did she say? How did she say it? My wish for you is to stay strong and sober for the rest of your life. And, you know, I was like, wow, you know what I mean? And now that was the grandma that was fun and, you know, had the great stories and, you know, she would smoke her pack of Winston's and drink her three beers a day and, you know, and, and she was just fun, you know? And for her to, to wish that upon me, I was like, you know, it, it hit me deep. That's good. So, so let's talk about a couple things and then we'll, we'll wrap up, but what, what was it like going to Hawaii? I mean, you've never been there. No, I was never in Hawaii. I mean, I so before Vegas, I was never like west of Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then I'm flying over the Pacific Ocean to Hawaii, and I'm I'm in the paradise. You know, I mean, snorkeling with you guys and seeing, you know, the beautiful stuff. The fish. Yeah, I mean, yeah. those fish. You know, and being scared that a shark was going to come, but hoping a shark did because, I mean, I love sharks. So it's like, you know, that experience was amazing. Like the, the beauty and like the eating the fresh fruit from the Island, like, you know, the rambutans and whatever else I ate, you know, I mean, it was awesome. Like the little side, the roadside shacks selling fruit, you know, like a quarter a piece, like it's just, a, it was beautiful, you know, and all the different things that we saw there and, you know, I mean, the sea turtle, 
That that yeah. okay. So that is one thing that stands out from Hawaii, is you tell a story how your first time there, you're swimming and a sea turtle swims underneath you. And it's yeah. like, damn, that's sweet, you know. And then we're there, and the first time we go down to where the race starts, there's a sea turtle right, right. there. Yeah. And then we're swimming, you know, the the. Iron Man track swimming out there and there's a sea turtle it's yeah. probably the, obviously probably the same one that was there the day before but like it's like damn like this stuff it just has a way of coming back it actually was the same one I saw all those I, years I bet ago. it was it came, hey guys nice they to live see you like again right years, yeah. so. <laughs> now how do you how do you take the the beauty of that island and relate it to the beauty of having a year in sobriety mm. and what's in your future how do you correlate those two so like we live in, you know, the outskirts of Toledo, and it's, you know, it's not a bad area where we live. It's nice. It's beautiful, nice scenery, and I got sober, and it was even more beautiful, right? Mm. So, like, I, I see the blue sky and the clouds, and everything's so clear, and then we leave here, and we fly out to Hawaii, and everything is so much more beautiful there, you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's, like, sobriety times a thousand yeah. you know like you look up you see the mountains the clouds up in the mountains and you know the stars at night and the sound of the ocean it, and you know like the true beauty of life like you know like like there's so much more than just one human like like i'm in hawaii looking out miles you know the human eye could see 12 miles so the horizon out there's roughly 12 miles away but there's so much more past that, yeah. you know, and then so many more islands and other people. And it, it's like being out there and looking out at the ocean like that, standing on lava rock and and hearing the waves and like looking down. And it, it just was beautiful because it, it something I never thought I'd do, but like prove that, you know, there's so much more to life than just living like, you know, like that was living being there, you know, or being alive, I mean. That that was living, like flying to Hawaii and being in Hawaii. That's living. You what, know. What's the future look like for you? Oh man, you know, just doing what I have to do as a dad and a man. You know, obviously I'm working now, and but I, honestly, like money, man, it, I want to have money to do fun things. I don't, you know, like I don't. I'm not gonna. I'm not living to work. You know, I'm working to live, and. Like, I, I want to be able to do these fun, amazing things with my daughter, you know? And, you know, like, I'd love to take her to Hawaii someday, mm -hmm. you know? Because the stories I told her and, you know, like, there's a picture in my phone where I FaceTimed her and I took a screenshot of her seeing that. Because she asked me, take a picture of a sea turtle if you mm -hmm. see one. And literally an hour later, we see a sea turtle. And I take, you know, I had a FaceTimer and her face, like... But I want her to see that in 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 true color. You know she what will. I mean? So, we'll be back. Yeah. 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 Um. Do you have any questions for me? I always ask when I'm doing these. Is there something you always wanted really, to ask me? Uh, I mean, I just pretty much I know what I need to know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm proud of you, dude. Thanks, man. Thanks for doing this. Thank you. Yep. Thanks for having me. Until next time, tune into the Racing for Recovery YouTube page, and if you need anything, please call us at 419-824-8462. We are here to help you be like this awesome dude. Take it easy. Yeah.